Welcome to Season 5 of Learning is the New Working. This is a special season that we recorded over two days in September of 2019 at the Learning Leaders Conference in Washington, D.C. The Learning Leaders Conference was an extraordinary event and a bold attempt to rethink the traditional professional conferences. It set out to connect a really diverse set of participants in non-traditional ways that emphasized inclusion, diversity of thought, deeper interactions, personal or small group reflection, and active participation in research studies, all in an exquisite space overlooking the Potomac River. The event was produced by Dawn Barron and four deeply experienced and committed CLOs who will meet later in the series, as well as a range of contributors and sponsors from the learning industry. The Learning Futures Group was invited to experiment with live podcast recording, and over the two days of the conference, we had the opportunity to talk to some of the great thinkers, leaders, business people, researchers, and the CLOs behind the conference. You might hear some background noise in some of our recordings because we set up our studio right in the middle of the conference floor so we could pick up on the vibe of everything that was going on. Now you can learn more about the conference at www.learningleadersconference.com and we've also curated a set of links to information about and content from our interviewees. In this episode, I meet with Matt Donovan, who is Vice President of GP Strategies Learning Solution Group, where he leads a global learning design, development, and delivery organization of over 1,400 people. GP Strategies is a major player in the global learning marketplace and one of the largest learning-focused service providers in the world, uh, with a focus on many aspects of workplace learning including outsourcing, uh, content development, and digital transformation of learning. As I observe uh, during our conversation, Matt runs what might be one of the biggest ID teams on the planet. And it struck me that Matt's really the first industrial strength instructional designer that we've had on the podcast. And as an instructional designer, his credentials are about as good as it gets. He's got more than 19 years experience leading teams in the crafting of training and development solutions. He has a master's in instructional design systems from Indiana University. He spent time as a learning architect with the legendary unext.com, where he built courses with top in top business schools, including Carnegie Mellon, uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business, Columbia Business School, and Chicago's Booth School of Business. He claims to have developed over 400 custom online courses and programs for Fortune 500 companies in the area of sales, marketing, manufacturing, clinical research, compliance, leadership, and ethics. And in our conversation, he turned in what was a really thoughtful state of the union on what's happening in the instructional design world. Matt calls himself a recovering instructional designer, but he doesn't wear a hair shirt. He's not a penitent. Uh, I think he believes that there is an essential core of the discipline that remains valuable and fit for purpose in the modern world. But that said, he also shares his learnings from his unique view, uh, both across the many customers that his team serves and from running his own team. We touch on topics such as the digital transformation of learning, including the escalating, con uh, escalating learner experiences and expectations based on their digital experience as consumers. Matt describes and shares uh, a really useful frame for thinking about the modern technology stack and importantly talks about where that should fit in the overall schema of design considerations. And then he shares six learning design mind shifts that he thinks are essential for transforming our profession. And he talks about the move to agile from waterfall and from integral manufacturing from discrete manufacturing in human enablement systems. Um, Matt believes that the core principles of instructional design will hold true, um, but the, there's hard work that the profession will have to do to modernize and stay relevant. Um, we need to be evidence-based, we need to be learner and business-centered, and we need to open up, in his opinion, the ecosystem to bring in stakeholders. After all, he says, we're not instructional psychics. 
Last but not least, we get a quick glimpse into GP's Innovation Kitchen, which is an ev evidence-based evaluation of learning platforms and tools that GP strategies use to road test and prototype approaches. Look, Matt's a really deeply experienced practitioner of instructional design, and I think his critical thinking on the future of the profession and the trends that will inform it seem even more valuable because of that experience. Why don't you listen into my conversation with GP Strategies' Matt Donovan. Welcome to Learning is the New Working. Can you introduce yourself and tell me what your day job is? So I'm Matt Donovan, uh, Vice President of GP Strategies. I oversee di digital learning strategies and services. And so my day job uh, includes both internal and external aspects. So externally, I work with clients and partners consulting on, I would say, their, their modern learning transformation initiatives. Uh -huh. And then internally, I support my teams and their journeys to meet the needs of our partners. So I oversee about 1,400 learning professionals, uh, one uh, directly supporting them through that journey as well. That's a lot of people, and they're all are most. Are they mostly deployed in uh, GP Strategies customers? In fact, maybe you should just tell us a little bit at the high level what is GP Strategies business? Okay. Well, in the simplest terms, GP Strategies is the uh, single largest end-to-end uh, -end value chain provider in the learning space. So when you think about from the strategy up front to um, you know creation, development of projects, creation of content, deployment, delivery, back-end solutions. So basically, in the overall learning and training value chain, we actually actually have services in every component. We do large outsourcing to large program initiatives. Um, we have focus in verticals like auto industry, uh, high tech industry, uh, pharmaceutical, financial. So we have a lot of our teams actually work with our clients and either they'll work in virtual if our clients are virtual. A lot of our financial partners are actually very virtual themselves. Mm -hmm. And then in some organizations, we are actually embedded more closely with them and uh, reflecting the culture of that organization. So I have to imagine that you probably run one of the largest instructional design teams in the world. Um, it's a really massive number of people. It is, and it is, and it's really you know complex. And when you think about how they're meeting several partners on their evolution and their journey, they're at very differing stages of you know the kind of value they're delivering to the customers and and meeting them where they're at. So it is a large organization with a lot of complex needs. Now, um, Matt, where do you live? What part of the world do you live and operate in? I'm out of Bloomington, Indiana, home of Indiana University. Okay. Uh, so I've uh, been there, raised in that area. I've been blessed and lucky to be able to grow up in the same area, but have all kinds of wonderful opportunities. So latest one is with GP Strategies. And my guess is that you don't necessarily spend all your time there. No. No, no, absolutely. I end up uh, traveling a lot, uh, supporting the teams around the world, enabling, supporting them, helping them think differently. Well, we're here at the Learning Leaders Conference uh, here in D.C., and you gave a keynote this morning, which was uh, really fascinating to me. I think you have you know, this really uh, unique view across the industry of what's going on in terms of instructional design and how programs are getting developed. And you shared a lot of your insights around the innovation process. Uh, but I like to start conversations with the forces at work. And mm -hmm. so if you think about the forces at work on the instructional design community, um, disruptive forces, uh, what, what do you see and what do you see happening that's making life interesting and perhaps <laughs> even difficult? Well, I think the single biggest thing is we're seeing that shortening of the gap between what's evolving in, in the workplace, the way in which people work together and the way in which they meet consumer customer needs and what we're actually seeing and rising in our learning uh, constituents, the, the stakeholders in our process. Mm. So when you think of like uh, organizations shifting to more digital experiences, you know, wrapping around their customers, uh, digital enterprises, digital operations, we're seeing a lot of that pressure and expectation coming into the learning space. When I have a great customer experience through my device, why can't I get my yes. learning in the same way? So we're yes. seeing that gap really narrow, which is a great and exciting time for us. I mean, it is for the first time we really have an opportunity to start to deliver some of the things we've been hoping to do for a long time. This is a little bit like BOYD, bring your own device in the IT space, where people could go out and buy these beautiful devices from from Apple, and uh, you know they're so easy to use, and the apps are great, and they come back to work, and all the IT <laughs> feels like it's from like last century, and nothing works, and nothing's elegant. Um, I think what you're describing is a similar kind of shift going on in the learning space. Is that right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I, I had that same kind of experience with, you know, why is my expense reimbursement system so clunky and difficult <laughs> when it seems to be so easy on my iPhone to send somebody a Venmo request? So, yeah. uh, and then the same thing in the learning space, you know, why can't it be as easy as Googling something to find it? And there's a lot of complexity behind that, but I think it's good to have that benchmark because now we have a shared goal of what are we going to, a vision that we can build off of. And that's been the hard part is having a unifying vision. So it can be you know, a challenge, but it can also be, uh, I'd say, a benefit to us because we have a direction we can go to. Can we deliver the same customer experience, the stakeholder experience that we've been trying to do for our external customers? Yeah, one of the ways we can do that, of course, is by stealing the tools that, that, that people are de uh, developing for the for the consumer world or from the operational world and so on and so forth. You had a nice uh, slide, which we can't replicate here on radio, <laughs> um, but I liked it. You have a frame of reference about how you think about learning technology. And, um, you know, you had maybe you could kind of walk us through that stack if you can remember it off the top of your head. Um, and then you talked a little bit about how the learning stack and the productivity stack are, are starting to come together. So can you can you sketch that out for yeah, us? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and lay that out. I think uh, so. So what you're referencing is when I was going back to to say how would I start to look at you know the appification of the learning industry. So we've yeah. had all these new tools come on the sets, and and like you know if you were doing woodworking, you have a whole range of tools to work with. The question is, what are you trying to do with it? And so what I try to do is a layout from a, a, a user or functional approach to it so one of the first the top layer you have is kind of coming into where's our point of entry where mm -hmm. do the learners need to go for that point of truth to get what they need in order to do things in the google context is a search window for us where does it come in and so you look at a range of platforms or solutions you have like a dynamic html5 portal that overlays over everything sometimes you'll have an lms as your front place sometimes you'll have a curation but you have a central front door yeah and then the next layer down, you start to look at your measurement and analytics layer. So how will we actually gather data between the platforms? How will we start to draw insights from them, bring them back in? You know, another layer I look at is how will people actually interact a device interaction layer? So are they going to be on a laptop, a wearable technology, heads up displays? Are they going to be in Changing a BYOD? Changing really rapidly. Absolutely. Lots of innovation in that space. And every one of those layers that we're looking at, they're quarterly because they're mostly cloud-based on a lot of those things. So your device technologies, your browser technologies, your connected technologies, all those things are being updated quarterly. So it's a constant state of flux with all these pieces and parts. So you're kind of looking at these layers and that connective tissue between them. So some of the things that holds them together are this uniformity of data exchange, mm -hmm. um, you know, responsive design principles. Mm -hmm. Some of these things are the things that kind of hold it together. So then you kind of move down the list if you got the devices. You think about your learner experience engagement. You talk about how people are interacting to learn through, you know, for example, I take a MOOC or like the Intrepid platform where it's time-based, but it's spaced and social. Or am I doing an adaptive learning platform that's going to help drive me through it? These are experiences that allow me to kind of both capture a little bit of that. Now, obviously, the adaptive learning also doubles in the analytics side as yeah. well because you're pulling a lot of data. So it's part experience and part uh, data on that side. And actually, all the platforms have data hookups uh, when they're doing it. Then you go to the next layer and you think about the content management. How do we develop, publish, store, share, manage the digital IP, all of that, that layer. And then the bottom one is like the building blocks, all the little nuggets of content we're building. You know, think of it as a PDF or a job aid or a course or an experience with all those little assets there. So those are the recombinable. So when you think about that top to bottom stack, all those layers get back to what are we trying to use or achieve with those? And the idea is, you know, how do you think about creating the best or most appropriate experience across those layers because it's, it's I don't think it's just one thing fits all one platform there's not one platform in our space that meets the entire it, journey yeah, of course then on the kind of the right side you think about the business side and so we have things like slack and, and Microsoft teams yeah. which are probably really shifting away from the point of a hierarchical email based structure for work now into the point of collaboration and that's where we're starting to think of you know, how do we start to embed, you know, learning and, and performance pieces into the you know, proverbial room of requirement like yeah. in, the, in Microsoft Teams? So we're yeah. wrapping them around the point of work. Yeah. So blending those two sides. So as, as that over time will kind of blur and, you know, the learning and the work will we'll no longer have these pass throughs. They will actually be one and the same. So what I love about your model is two things. One is this increasing migration 
from a portal, you know, a single place of entry, to integration on these kind of new productivity modalities, whether it's Teams or Slack or so on and so forth, just differently. But more importantly,